So it's this ego thing, right? We want to own, we want to hold. It's our baby and we see unlimited potential, but that's not how we grow. And we've got to be humble enough. You're coming straight out of college, um, thinking full of testosterone, you can take over the world. And you've gone from a hundred thousand dollars to 30,000 and realizing that you need the mentors, you need to, you know, give up some of the equity and, and own smaller bits of bigger things. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's an amazing analogy. And so, uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's why I started. And actually, early on, I thought, let me own a thousand single family homes, because I own single family home rentals. And I felt like that was my expertise. That's, that's what I really knew best. And, uh, and once I got over 100 single family homes that I was owning, uh, it was just, it was crazy. There, the single family homes are all over the town. Each one is different. Uh, I've got maintenance and, and leasing and they're running all over driving across town. And then I started learning about apartments and I was thinking, man, if this, if this is a hundred unit apartment, every, everything's in one place. I can control the grounds. I can, can you know, my staff is right there on site. Uh, and, and then also banks, just love to loan on multifamily real estate so I could have amazing, amazing terms. None of course as well, right? That's part of the challenge when you get to a certain number of single family homes. Even if you go to duplexes and complexes, you eventually tap out with regarding, you know, the financing you can get. And leverage is important if you play it well to get great returns in real estate. Yeah, yeah. And I actually, the single family homes that I owned, I would own free and clear because I just couldn't find debt terms that made sense. It just felt too risky there. You know, there's not enough margin to put loans on these single family homes because if the tenant moves out, for example, you're, you've got no cash flow where. Right, and were you, were you just doing uh, fix and flips uh, or were you holding these single family rentals? Because it makes no sense if you're coming in, putting debt on, paying these transaction costs and fees and then flip right? You might as well just take cash for a short term from a hard money lender. Yeah. So I was initially holding properties. Uh, so I was doing flips to f- get enough cash to hold uh, properties. Yes. And actually my first good year, Zane, I had, uh, I had five properties that I had cherry picked and I had, uh, I had in, as my buy and hold, kind of my, my rental properties. And then uh, once the tax return was filed, I had to sell three of those properties to pay the tax bill. Uh, so I, that was one of those light bulb moments where I was thinking, how am I going to do this? H- how am I going to you know, make this cash, invest it into real estate, hold it if every year I'm going to have to sell off half of the portfolio to pay a tax bill. And so that's the power of syndication is that you can go out and buy properties uh, you can have, you can partner up with investors to bring the majority of equity. So you don't have to try to figure out where to get after tax, your after tax dollars, you team up with other people. And then you step, for example, you buy a $10 million property uh, and you're able to keep say 20% ownership of that. You just increased your net worth by 2 million. Um, but you didn't have to come up, you didn't have to go earn $3 million for the down payment. You brought in investors uh, for that. So it's a lot easier to grow. So now you're on the path of trying to solicit investors because you've got your eyes on some opportunities. How did you go about doing that? And how did you scale that up? Because that's a lot of work to go one-on-one to each investor. And this is how real estate works. You've got to do it. The rewards are big. But you've done something different. You've scaled it. You, you now have what, 1,200 units, $190 million plus portfolio. How, how did you go, how did you get there from you know, 100,000 to 30,000 now here? Like you said, we have 600 plus investments and, and a few thousand people, maybe more than 4,000 people uh, who have registered with us to invest with us. And so uh, back in 2012, 2013, I, so b- before that, like I said, my grandma was my first investor, right? So, so very close networking. And, and quite honestly, Zane, you know this, the, the people that are really going to invest with you at first are going to be people who trust you, who care for you. It's going to be a really close circle. Uh, it's hard to convince dollars uh, that. 
I mean, this part is full of friends and family. Yeah. Money. Yeah. So, uh, so what had happened is I grew that friends and family network from doing my fix and flips and wholesale deals. That was very transactional. And so I would bring in, uh, so, so that network grew friends and family kind of, there's a little bit of a word of mouth effect, uh, but really what happened is in 2013, uh, the very first real estate crowdfunding websites came online. And so now people, you could, from a website, you could see a real estate deal, learn about it and invest in it. And I was, I was thinking, man, that I, for whatever reason, it caught my eye. I didn't have any really strategic long-term vision on it. I just thought, this is amazing. Uh, I want to do this. I, I want to post my deals to a, a website and get them funded by investors. And, and actually I had gone to a couple of those first real estate crowdfunding platforms and asked them, my, my first thought was, I'll just post my deals on their platform and get them funded. But they wanted to work with institutional uh, real estate operators, not, not, you know, not, not someone that, I think their requirement was at least 100 million or or 50 million in assets under management. And I was not at that point. And so, uh, so after some rejections, I thought, well, why don't I just build my own website so that I can, I can drive some traffic and I, I can get people to this site, get them registered, and then I can post my deals and, and I'll just fund them. I'll, I'll just find my own investors and I'll make this happen. And that's exactly what we did. So you want to list your deal on the existing real estate crowdfunding platform. And you said, you know what, screw that. I don't have the net worth or the assets and the management required, but I'm doing this anyway. I want to go buy real estate. I'm going to people one-on-one. -on -one. Why not just make an online platform and, and work with them? So is that sort of the thought process that led you to this? And, and so I, I thought that what, what it was also trending these being able to invest online through a crowdfunding platform was a trending topic. So I felt like I could kind of latch onto that by positioning my company as a crowdfunding platform because people were learning about it. It was, it was becoming kind of a hot topic. And so we got a lot of traffic from people just looking for real estate crowdfunding investing. And so we positioned our site in that sense, even though we weren't a traditional crowdfunding site. Why, what do you mean by that? What's a traditional crowdfunding site and what were you then? So a traditional crowdfunding site uh, is the, the crowdfunding company is really an intermediary. They're the middleman. They're, they're going and finding real estate sponsors and real estate investments. And then they're finding investors and matching them together. And then they're just taking their commissions and cuts in between. Uh, I was the real estate sponsor uh, and, and going out and finding my investors. So, so there was no, there was no intermediary. Uh, it was direct, uh, direct to my company. I, for example, I didn't post the only investments I post on my site were deals I was doing, not other people's deals. So what does that mean for the end user? And is, first, is this still the model today with Holdfolio? Yeah, that's still the model. We, uh, yeah. So how, how do you address this? I mean, I get it. There's a hundred plus different real estate crowdfunding platforms now. Most of these market themselves as marketplaces where we are, you know, just basically finding and cherry picking the best deals. And they're across a variety of different real estate vendors, so we say developers. We're letting you choose where you want to go. So the thought here is if you're the end user, you've got unlimited choice and you're you're trusting the 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 fact that this platform has so much deal flow that they're able to choose. How do you how do you think about what you're offering and how that compares? Really, from what I've learned is that uh, more choices and you probably know this as well doesn't necessarily mean better and so on these traditional sites they have many different sponsors and and a lot of that is a great service but sometimes it's intriguing to think that if this is one group one sponsor all i have to do is that then and then uh you know i don't have to worry about all the different types of sponsors and i think that's that's one of the big uh, lures uh, and advantages of why someone might choose to invest with us. So Jacob, let's talk about the dynamics of this industry. My perception, even as an investor looking at the space is that there are lots of different crowdfunding platforms and they have to be selective. 
they have to only choose a small percentage of the dealers that they have uh, that they look at because you don't want to overwhelm the end user with choice. Where does this industry grow? Where does this industry go in that case? Because you're now seeing lots of different crowdfunding platforms picking up. If you can't get your deal listed on one exclusively, you're going to go to the next one. So you've got this huge ocean of different crowdfunding platforms, each just selecting by their own criteria. Where does this market go? This is crazy right now. You know, I, I wish I had an answer for you. And I've thought about it on many occasions about, about why people, and investing is a big decision, right? I, there's a lot of trust and, and a lot of things that go in that. So a lot of it is kind of network, network effects, who you know will dictate where you end up, what platform you find. And, and it, I don't know. I don't know the answer in turn. We have, of course, the financial markets and the stock exchange, and it's all, you know, under, under more or less one umbrella, but the, the alternative investments uh, are, are not. There's, there, there's a lot of different avenues uh, to get involved. Let's be clear. This madness is a good thing overall for the ecosystem because the current status quo and the way history has been is that it's all done offline. In that case, the end user doesn't even have access to the best deals. They're dealing with their friend and hopefully they meet someone like you who actually has a good track record, has integrity, isn't going to run away with grandma's money, right? It's going to work hard to make sure you pay your investment back. Um, so it's okay having lots of different platforms. These are basically tech enabled um, syndications really. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering, you drew the analogy to the stock markets, right? There is a bar to be listed uh, in a you know, large cap stock exchange. Um, but we're used to it. The market's evolved, you know, and you've got different indexes. Can we come up with something like that for the real estate industry? And is regulation holding us back here in, in you know, crowdfunding? Well, could you touch on those topics? Yeah, I think that certainly people have had that vision and, and there's probably platforms out there uh, selling that vision as, as well. Uh, from a regulation standpoint, I don't know if they're necessarily, if that necessarily, business that is standing in the way. I think that it probably is close to what you've, what you've said yourself. There's a lot of deals. Uh, there's hundreds and thousands of deals out there. And so being able to present that in a way that doesn't feel overwhelming or, or uh, you know, too much, it's, it's tricky. There's a lot of moving pieces, I think, certainly. Yeah. Do you see any obvious areas for improvement overall? Any, any, any key aspects, for example, when you've been building out portfolio, what did you guys focus really, really hard on to make sure you deliver a better experience? Obviously, you're not someone who's going to copy others, right? I can see the way you've approached things. You're always innovating. You're a software entrepreneur, as you describe yourself. So how, how did you make your experience even better? And are there things you focus on more as values for portfolio and, and the other things you do? I am a big fan of ease of use and simplicity. So if there's, if there, if we can do the same thing uh, in a more simple, easy, user-friendly way, then we, we have to do it. We owe ourselves that, the ability to do that. And, and one example of that is syndication documents. So historically, if you looked at um, private placement memorandums and, and syndication documents, related. So if you wanted to go invest in a syndication, the document review, there's lots of legal jargon. Uh, there's, there's probably at least a hundred pages of different terms and, and things. And, and I remember sitting there early on and thinking, does someone even read this? And, and so, so that was a big part of, of making it also structures like investment structure. I'm going to give you a dollar zane for a project. And how are we going to split the profit, right? We could most simply say 50-50. Uh, you get 50%, I get 50%, and that's very simple. Uh, but there's much more complicated investment structures and, and schemes. Uh, and I, I think that from my perspective as a, real, as a real estate sponsor and someone putting together syndications, I've always tried to make it very simple. Uh, you can't describe it in one easy sentence how your investor gets their, their profits return to them, then it's too complicated. Uh, and, and so that goes, that goes also uh, on, the, on the software side. If, 
if the investor wants to come and, and review your deal and do some due diligence and potentially make an investment with you, they shouldn't have any hurdles to that process, right? They shouldn't, they shouldn't have any roadblocks. You want to make that as simple and user friendly. Uh, and, and so, so that, that's a big cornerstone of, of what I, what I try to do when developing software and, and product. Uh, it is just enabling the users uh, to, to actually get behind it and use it.